Hello and welcome back to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and equip Christian women to be all in in faith and family. Today on the podcast, we are speaking with a best-selling author, Karen Eman, about two of her latest books that just released, Reach Out, Gather In, and Make Their Day. In today's world, with everything that is going on, it can be so difficult to reach out to our friends and family and spend quality time with them in the way that we used to. We are having to social distance and not go to their homes, and that could just make it very difficult to connect when all we're doing is scrolling on Facebook, liking their posts, and maybe leaving a little comment. So that's why I'm so excited to talk to Karen today, because she is sharing some very practical wisdom and encouragement to help us to connect with our friends and family and brighten other people's day, even in the age that we are at now. So if this is something that you are interested in, you want to learn more, how can I connect with other people? How can I make a difference in the lives of the people around me? I hope that you will stay tuned. Well, welcome, Karen, to the Equipping Godly Women podcast. I'm so excited to get to talk to you today. Will you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, and how we might know you online? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. A little bit about myself is I have been married for over a quarter century, actually over 30 years now, to my college sweetheart, Todd, and we have three adult children. Two of them have recently gotten married within the last two years. So now I have five children, three biological and two by marriage, but I forget which are which. And uh, we live in the middle of Michigan where it's very cold here today. And I speak and write for Proverbs 31 Ministries, both for the online devotional and for our first five Bible study app. And I love what I do. I just love helping women to live their priorities and love their lives. Well, you have had so many books come out, especially over the last couple of years since I have been aware of your online presence. And I'm just amazed that you had a book come out in October. And then again, in February, you must be one very busy lady. How are you managing? This is just a personal question. How are you writing all of these amazing books? Well, as we all know, 2020 was very different and we were homebound. So all of my speaking engagements got canceled in 2020. I didn't have any in January and February. But from March on out, they all got canceled. So I thought, well, I'm home anyway. I'll just crank it up in the writing area. And so I wrote Reach Out, Gather In, which is a 40-day challenge on hospitality, both in your home and outside your home. And that released in October of 2020. And right after I turned that in, my editor said, you know what, it'd be great to kind of have a companion book that was a lot of ideas for people to implement. They kind of got the inspiration through Reach Out, Gather In. Now let's give them even more ideas for scattering love and encouragement wherever they go. So that became the, the little gift book called Make Their Day, and it's 101 simple and powerful ways to love others well. So I, I like to think of writing as just talking on paper, and I can talk until the cows come home. You know, my husband always teases he's going to put a period on my tombstone because I'll finally be done talking. So I know people might think, wow, you wrote two books in one year. That's crazy. But for me, I had all the extra time because I wasn't traveling and speaking. And it's to me really just talking on paper. And I also, I use voice dictation. I don't type with my fingers. So that helps it go a lot faster as well. Nice. I need to do more of that. Um, So I want to talk to you specifically about your first book, Reach Out, Gather In. Not your first book ever, but your two set. Um, I want to talk about this book because we have all just, we are still living through a global pandemic and everything that has been happening, like you said, we're home. And so we are in a time right now where we are really isolated from other people, of course, for their health and safety and concern. And that's wonderful. But this has really led to this time when this idea of hospitality, I feel like is really going by the wayside. And I'm sure that you have noticed that as well. Can you speak to a little bit when you first got the idea of of writing, reach out, gather in, was it a result of everything that's been going on? Or was this something that has been on your heart anyways? And it just kind of the timing worked out. Well, the topic's been on my heart for years because I got married and I didn't know anything about cooking and cleaning. I could barely boil water but I married into a family that was full of interior decorators and people that could cook. One of them owned a bed and breakfast, one of my um, sisters-in-law. And I remember back then 
really setting out to show these women that I could be artsy smartsy too. And I tried to learn all the, the tips and tricks of decorating and learn how to cook fancy food. And it was then that God began to get me on the page that he's on. And that is that hospitality is very different. What, what the Bible calls hospitality than what the world calls entertaining. Entertaining seeks to impress your guests and make them think, you know, you've just got it going on, right? You, you're just doing everything like they do in all the TV shows. But hospitality doesn't seek to impress. It seeks to refresh your guests. And it's more about them and making them feel wanted and welcome. And so over the years, I've learned that hard lesson. And I've gotten a lot of ideas and recipes and tips and tricks. And I had a lot of friends that said, boy, I wish that you would put all those in a book or something so that we could have it. And so that's what I did. And I actually wrote the book right before the pandemic. I think I turned it in like January 31st or something of 2020 when I was just starting to all that was happening and everything that unfolded that was 2020. But thankfully in the book, I have a lot of ideas for taking your hospitality on the road because nowadays, you know, hospitality doesn't always look like opening your front door and inviting a bunch of guests in to sit down at your table and have a home cooked meal. We have to think a little out of the box and realize that hospitality is about making people feel noticed and wanted and welcomed wherever they are, whether that's in our home or it's on the sidelines of the soccer field or at work or at church or wherever it is. Well, will you talk to us a little bit about what are some of the common reasons why we don't extend this hospitality, even if we would want to? I know for me, like I love getting together with my friends and yet it doesn't happen as often as it should. So what are some of the yeah. very specific things that are preventing us? Well, before I get into the specifics of what is preventing us, I want to I want to address a little bit, I think, the why we come up with all these excuses for these different things. And I think it's something actually that is both a blessing and a curse. And that is, sorry to say, HGTV, even though I love that channel. You know, so often we watch those shows and we think, boy, if I can't cook like that person who has their own cooking show, or I don't have a newly remodeled kitchen complete with subway tile or a living room with shiplap, not that I don't love both of those things. I love both of those things. But we look at all these experts and we think, if I can't do it like the experts do, then I'm just not gonna, gonna do it at all. So we come up with excuses like my house isn't fancy enough or nice enough or clean enough, or my food isn't gourmet enough, or my kids might not behave. You know, All of these things that we come up with as excuses for not offering hospitality because we think we have to do it like all the professionals do. And I think what's helped me most is to realize that the things I stress about as a hostess that I think people are going to be looking at and wanting, they're nothing that I'm interested in when I am on the other side of the coin and I'm a guest in someone's house. You know, if you were to invite me over and we could do that, <laughs> it's a day and age in whatever state you live in, because I know it's different everywhere, but I would not be going to your house thinking, boy, you know, I really hope the house is fancy and big and recently remodeled. I hope there's gourmet food and the kids behave perfectly. No, I would just want to have a good time and feel like you were interested in my life and that you wanted me over. The things that we stress about as a host or hostess aren't anything that really is important to our guests. So we need to get those professionals out of our mind, use them as a resource, but don't try to mimic them as a lifestyle. They're a great resource to get recipes and decorating ideas. I'm all for that but not to let us migrate our minds to a place where we think we have to do it exactly like the experts or we're just, we're out. We're just not even going to try. Yeah. And I know one thing for <clears throat> me that has held me back from having people over is just assuming, oh, well, they must be busy. Like, oh, I don't want to bother them. Like I shouldn't invite them. They have a family. They have a hundred other things going on. But then of course, I imagine we have to remember, you know, you can invite someone that doesn't obligate them that they have to come. You can still extend that invitation for whenever would work for yeah. them. Yeah. Will you also talk to us, what can this look like in a season that we're in right now where we can't always meet in people's homes, whether that's because of health concerns or we, you know, say I know a family of five children and I have a small house and I'm say, oh, I want to get together with them, but I can't invite that large family over into my teeny tiny house. For years, this was my situation because we had five people in our family and we lived in a house, I think it was 934 square feet. So it was very small. Our kitchen was super tiny. You had to fold both ends of the table down to push it to the side during the day so you could walk through the kitchen and then we would 
pop those table ends up and pull the table out to eat. It was very small. So for a lot of years, we had to get really creative when it was time to have people over. So we would put the adults around that small table that could seat four kind of comfortably. And then we would spread a blanket on the living room floor and let the kids eat picnic style. Or we would eat outside and have an old fashioned picnic in the backyard. Or you don't even have to use your house, you know, meet someone at a park and just say, just show up. I'm gonna bring the big picnic basket full of goodies. Or if restaurants and, and coffee houses are open when people are listening to this in their particular state, meet someone at a coffee house and you can still offer hospitality there and make them feel wanted and welcomed and treat them to a sweet treat and something hot and creamy to drink and get to know them on a, a deeper level rather than just, hey, how are you? But really get to know them and let the local eatery do the hosting and provide the location while you provide the conversation. And two, you can get creative with drop-offs and drive-bys. And I have a whole section where I talk about the ministry of the mailbox. You can do some things through the mail that can make people feel noticed and welcomed. And it doesn't have to always look like having people into your home. Well, I love that you mentioned that, that we can show hospitality so many different ways. It doesn't have to mean that they come over and sit around our fancy dining room table and have this meal together, which when I think of hospitality is often what I think of, oh, we're going to have this formal thing and we're going to invite these people over and have this like nice dinner and my kids are going to be good, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully. But I love that you talk about, okay, it can look so many different ways. When we extend hospitality, it's not just this HGTV picture, but it's just opening up our lives and our families to other families as well. One thing that you talk about in the book is how we can use our spiritual gifts in order, you know, in conjunction with being hospitable. Can you tell us some more about what you talk about that? How do our spiritual gifts play a role in showing other people hospitality? Yeah, we've got to get to the place where we stop looking at other people and how they're wired and how they're gifted and what their talents are and uh, you know sit there and wish that we were like them and just start where we are with how God has naturally wired us our passions our our interests our talents our spiritual gifts so somebody might have the spiritual gift of hospitality that is a spiritual gift and not all of us have it so they're going to be a little more um, comfortable perhaps offering hospitality, but maybe you have a different gift. Maybe it's what some Bible versions call helps and some call service, and you're just very servant-hearted. And so you're going to offer hospitality by offering to help somebody with something. Maybe you have a friend that's working on a project or that, you know, has a lot of things that she needs to get done around her house. And so you can show up there and provide a meal in her house and help her with something. Or maybe you have the spiritual gift of encouragement and you just want to have someone over for something super simple. It doesn't have to even be homemade. Maybe you just order pizza and have ice cream sandwiches, but you're there to offer her encouragement because she's going through something and you want to sit and listen to her. So your strong point might not be the food and the decor, but your, your strong point is that you're good at listening and encouraging. Or maybe you have the gift of teaching and you want to open your home and have a Bible study. Or maybe you have the gift of wisdom and you are a little bit older than some of the moms in your neighborhood, your circle of friends, your church, and you want to do a little mentoring by opening your home. And I had a woman that did this to me about 20 years ago, and she would just serve tea and muffins and she would have all the young moms over and she would just say, okay, what questions do you have? And people would talk. We would be there sometimes two or three hours. We had childcare and this woman just used her gift of wisdom to answer questions. And sometimes she didn't know the answer, but she would pray with us about it. And it was such a sweet time just being in her home for tea and muffins and watching her use her gift of wisdom. So however it is that you're wired, just pray to God and he will answer. He will give you a creative way to make others feel welcomed by using your spiritual gift. I love that. I have a question about what you just said, though. You mentioned that hospitality is a spiritual gift, and we all have different spiritual gifts. So if we are someone who says, okay, hospitality isn't my spiritual gift, does that mean that they're off the hook? No, because there's also a gift of faith. So if your spiritual gift isn't faith, do you say, well, I'm off the hook. I don't have to have faith. I don't have to pray. No, I mean, there are spiritual gifts where that's how you're naturally wired and it comes comfortable to you and it's kind of in your wheelhouse. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have that gift, you're off the hook because elsewhere in scripture, 
we're told to practice hospitality. I think it's Romans 12, 13, and it's written as a command. It's not written as a suggestion. It, anywhere that you see hospitality in the New Testament, it doesn't say, now, if you're going to offer hospitality, do it this way. It says offer hospitality. Even one place it says without grumbling or complaining um, is what it means in the Greek. So we're, we're not off the hook. We all are to be doing it. It's a command, but some people are just going to be a little bit, you know, um, more adept at, uh, at it because they're somebody that does have that spiritual gift. Just like with teaching, there are people that have the spiritual gift of teaching and they're, they're just natural at it and they're great at it. But you know, if you're a mom, or a dad, you're a teacher, you're teaching your kids. It doesn't mean you're off the hook and you never teach anybody. There's just certain places where we are called to concentrate our efforts because it's how we've been wired and it's the gift that God has given us. That makes sense. You also talk about crafting a spiritual resume in your book. What do you mean by that? So take those spiritual gifts, but also take your interests, your passions, you know, the talents that you have, the, the hobbies that you have that you're, you're great at. And there's actually a part in the book where I walk people through coming up with a spiritual resume based on all of these things. There's some questions you work through. And in the back, there's a little certificate kind of document looking thing that you photocopy and you can put in your answers and put it on a bulletin board or wherever you have in your home. So you can see it right there before you, but it just combines all of those things, your gifts, your talents, your passions, your hobbies. And then it helps you to think, how can I use these things, these ways God has naturally wired and gifted me to help others? I'll give you an example. I have a friend, her spiritual gift is encouragement, but her talent is she's great at picking out paint colors and painting. Like she comes up with these colors. I think, oh, it's going to look horrible on my wall. And she's like, trust me. And so one time I remember we painted my whole living room. This, this color was called gum leaf. It was kind of a green, kind of a blue, kind of a grade, almost like sagey brown color. It was really a, a very different color. And in the, the color paint swatch section of the store, I didn't like it. But she said, just trust me. And so she brought all her stuff and she came over and we visited that day and she helped me paint without slopping everywhere. And she talked to me about some things I was going through and she was so encouraging. And she used that gift of encouragement and her talent of painting to minister to me. So just think of the different things that, that you're good at. Maybe, you know, you're great at gardening and you have somebody in your life who wants to learn how to garden, teach them. You know, maybe you're good at cooking and you have a young wife at your church that just got married and she's a little nervous because she doesn't know how to boil water. Have her over for a time of hospitality, but also to use your natural talent of cooking to teach her how to cook. There are so many ways we can be using our gifts and talents if we just focus in on how God's wired us and quit looking at other people and thinking, boy, I wish I could teach a Bible study of 100 women like so-and-so does. Well, maybe that's not your gift, but that person, there are things that they can't do that you can based on how God's designed you. So really take it to the Lord and ask, you know, what are these things that are on my spiritual resume and how can I use them to further your kingdom? That's a great idea. Another concept that you talk about in the book is to go find your old self. Will you tell us some more about what that means? Yes. So I think of the scripture, I believe it's in Corinthians where it says that God comforts us so that we in turn can comfort others with the comfort we have received from God. And this concept has worked out in my life. I, I like to call it going and finding your old self. And it basically is this. Think of a time when you needed God's comfort, when you went through something that was hard in your life. For me, it was being a teen from a broken home where, you know, I lived with a single mom, living on a budget so tight it squeaked. And then I would go to my dad's house on alternate weeks. And um, it was hard for me back then. In my tiny little town, there were, weren't very many people who were from divorced homes. And my parents were doing the best they could to make a, a bad situation better for me, but it was still kind of sad and lonely. So fast forward to, especially when my youngest was when in high school, often my kitchen island was full of his friends who were from divorced homes. And I could honestly look them in the eye when they were talking about something that was hard and say, I know just how you feel. And so it might be something you went through in childhood. It might be that once upon a time, you were a maxed out mom pushing your kids in the grocery store cart and, you know, the baby was crying, the toddler was screaming and pulling stuff off the shelf. You know, when you encounter someone like that in the grocery store now, 
don't roll your eyes at them and think, well, my children never behaved like that because you know that they did. Instead, you know, give her a smile and slip her a $10 bill and say, hey, on the way home, swing by and get yourself a latte. It looks like you could, could use one. You're doing a great job, mom. It's important what you're doing. Hang in there. Or it can be as, you know, that's a simple way of finding your old self, but it can be um, on an even grander scale. I have a friend uh, named Michael, who for years was an alcoholic, and now for 10 years, he has not touched alcohol. He's completely sober, and he has started a ministry, a halfway house for men who have been incarcerated because their um, alcoholism has landed them in jail, and now they're coming out and trying to reacclimate to society and not drink, and so he's started this halfway house because he wants to go back and minister to that person that's in the situation that he once found himself in. So that's what it means to go find your old self. Well, I love this idea of taking the things that you can do and the things that you know and all of your past experiences and using just like a toolbox, I'm imagining, using all these things that God has given you to go be a blessing to other people, whatever that looks like in your life, because it's going to look different, you know, depending on which stage of life you are at, which leads us right into your second book that you have coming out. It is called Make Their Day. Will you tell us just briefly a little bit about this book, what readers will find in it, who it's for? Sure. Yeah, this is, um, the first one was more a 40 day challenge and make their day. I actually have a copy of it here because I just got my copy the other day. Um, it's 101 simple ideas for loving others well. And there are different categories. There's friends, family, there's a whole section on across the, the miles or through the mail. There's one section on for those who are hurting or, you know, are down in life. There's one for holidays, holy days, and just the everyday. There's a section for church members, and they're all just very simple, doable, mostly inexpensive ideas for just reaching out and encouraging someone and scattering a little kindness, because I'm telling you, <laughs> in our current culture, I mean, who couldn't use a little more love and kindness and brightening of your day rather than, you know, so much of the hurling of hate we see now online and in person. I just wanted to give people ideas, because, you know, I think often we think, boy, you know, I, I should really do something for them, but we don't have an idea. So this is 101 somethings that you can simply do that will brighten someone's day. Yeah, I love that. I know that I feel that way frequently where I'm like, oh, I see this person. I want to do something. I have no idea what to do. So I love that you have just this whole collection of ideas, depending on where you are in life, um, just to be a blessing to other people. Before yeah. we wrap up today, is there anything else that you didn't get to share that you would love to make sure that you um, tell our listeners about? Well, when we were talking about going and finding your old self, it makes me think of a story in Reach Out Gather In of a, a boy I call Second Grant. I call him Second Grant because when he moved to our school district, there was already one Grant in the gang of friends. And so Second Grant, he would come over with the other football players. They'd spend the night on Friday nights. And I used to try to get up really early on Saturday mornings because I knew I could do writing then because I wouldn't be interrupted because the boys weren't going to get up until about 10 o'clock and want their homemade waffles or whatever I was making that morning. But Second Grant was an early riser. And so he would often bound up the stairs and plop himself <laughs> next to me and uh, say, what you doing, Mama Karen? And I was working on the message that ended up becoming Reach Out Gather In, and I would think, um, I'm trying to work on a book about noticing people and making them feel welcome if you would leave me alone, you know, <laughs> that's what I was saying. Um, but there were always these kids at my house. I would be in my office sometimes working on a book, and I'd walk out to the kitchen to get more coffee, and I didn't even know my son was home, but I would see this huge pile of shoes, and he would bound up the stairs about that time, and I would say, oh, hey, you're home. Who'd you bring with you? And he would rattle off all the names, you know, Javari and Emilio and first and second Grant and all these boys. Well, fast forward after knowing Grant about six months, one day he asked me if I was doing something, my husband and I, the third Saturday in March, I thought it was because he wanted me to make food for some game that was on television. But instead he said that he had been listening to me because I did eventually shut my laptop and listen to him and not work on my message. And, you know, cause I felt like the Lord was saying, Oh, I get it, Karen. You want to give the message. You just don't want to live it. You know, hello, there's someone sitting right in front of you. And I had talked to him about the Lord and so had someone else in his life. And the third Sunday in March that year, he was getting baptized because he said he had just accepted Christ and responded to the gospel and he was going to be baptized. And so my husband and I got to go and sit there bawling when not only he, but his brother and his mother were all baptized into the faith. And it made me think of that pile of shoes. You know, I think when we get to heaven, God's not gonna say, 
was your house fancy? You know, did you have really great food? Were you super successful in your career or raised stellar children? I think he's going to say what I used to say to my son when I saw that pile of shoes. Oh, hey, you're home. Who'd you bring with you? Who did you bring with you? And we can bring others with us by simply allowing them to pull up a chair and join us in life in our very ordinary homes, our very ordinary lives, however we can do it in this day and age with the pandemic, but just opening our lives to others and making them feel noticed can be an avenue to share the gospel with them and it, they can be in heaven with us someday too. Well, thank you, Karen, so much for sharing that beautiful story and just everything that you've shared with us today. All of your wisdom has my head spinning with ideas now of how I can go do this as well. And hopefully everyone listening is feeling the same. Will you tell us how we can find more from you online in general and then specifically about your latest two books? Sure. The easiest way is just to go to my website because everything's right there on the homepage. And my website is kareneman.com and Eman is spelled E-H-M-A-N. And there they can find links to purchase the book. They can find where I'm hanging out online. My favorite place is Instagram, but I do have Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest as well. And I would love to connect with people there. All right, so that just about does it for today's episode. If you would love to hear more from Karen, be sure to visit her website, kareneman.com, spelled K-A-R-E-N. E-H-M-A-N to learn more about her brand new books, reach out, gather in, and make their day. And of course, if you are brand new here, you should know that my latest book, Fall in Love with God's Word, Practical Strategies for Busy Women, just came out as well. So if you have not ordered your copy, I would love for you to check it out as well. And you can learn more about that at fallinlovewithgodsword.com.